I was doing a lot of crystal meth and MDMA, um, ecstasy, coke. Violence, abuse, racism. The majority of the girls who um, are coming into treatment, they've experienced a lot. You know that someone hurts that much that they have to steal a hand sanitizer and drink that to feel some goodness? That's sad. I've had those days where I just, I just didn't want to live anymore. White Buffalo Treatment Center at Sturgeon Lake, Saskatchewan, was established in 1996 in response to the rampant abuse of solvents among Canada's Aboriginal youth. Crucial to the development of the center and its program was determining the best possible facilitators to run it, those most likely to connect with these troubled and vulnerable teens. Well, first of all, they'd like to sit with someone their own color and then someone that's been through it. The girls did really good. They someone like Lonnie Longclaws, case coordinator at White Buffalo. I went into uh, corrections for a bit, and it wasn't my thing, because when I was in corrections, <laughs> I was sitting listening to everybody. I wasn't guarding anybody. I'd sit and listen to their stories. After I had all my children and I left my husband and ran into my own problems with alcohol and, you know, stuff from the past coming up. And so I had to deal with that. So I put, you know, I asked for help and put myself into actually two treatment centers. And the second treatment center was very cultural. I said, you know, if, if I get through this, I'm going to start helping other people out that are going through this stuff. So I went back to school and then came here as a student. And I've been here ever since. So this is our classroom and our gym. And in here, we have a new classroom where you will be attending school Monday to Friday. I used to drink a lot. Um, I used to do drugs. Um, I wasn't happy. I'm here because just did a lot of bad stuff. I was in a lot of trouble all the time, and I did drugs, like hard drugs, and I was drinking a lot. I grew up from a rough childhood with my mom being an alcoholic, and my dad wasn't really there. I've had depression like, since my sister died in 2004. It's already been 10 years and it's, it, it still feels like it just happened. She was always there for me. I mean, she's always encouraged me to stay in school and, you know, keep my head up and not care what people would say to me. Because when I was younger, I got bullied a lot. The majority of the girls who um, are coming into treatment, they've experienced a lot at a young age, uh, violence, abuse, racism, and so they're coming from a place that, that's very difficult and challenging. It's not only addiction to like drugs. It's, I had an addiction to self-harm and hurting myself. I used to be good, I guess, and then I just kind of changed as soon as I got into high school. I started drinking a lot. Um, I was doing a lot of crystal meth and MDMA, um, ecstasy, Coke. I felt like I was unwanted. I fought with my family constantly. I work in summers and um, so like I would get my money and then I would go get, get drugs, go get alcohol. 
And my sister came here before me in 2012. And then uh, she passed away from alcohol poisoning. She got influenced by drugs and alcohol by her friends. And um, she was 16 when she passed away. It's been really hard as out here and depression started to build up and I kind of dropped out of school from there. We are seeing inhalants coming back. Propane, there's camping fuel, especially in the northern communities. Still mainly gasoline is the big thing. It seemed to die down for a little while. And in the last year, I know Labrador, it's just swept through there again. Same in uh, northern Saskatchewan. We are seeing more severe accidents with girls that are using inhalants. We've had a young lady up north that did die. She was um, startled when she was inhaling and had a heart attack. And another girl was sniffing gas and she lit a lighter and she burnt most of her body. And what it does to the body, inhaling gas, it takes about three, four seconds to shoot to the brain. So it's like a quick, quick, quick high. But of course, it, it kills brain cells, right? It affects the whole body, and that's what we teach the girls. I finally just, you know, went back to my counselor and told her I needed help. I had teachers, doctors, my mom, they kind of all came together and thought it would be good for me to come here. A couple months ago, my cousin was like, you're ending up like your brothers and sisters, and I'm like, no, I'm not. And then they just like, yes, you are. You're on drugs and alcohol, and you're not listening to your parents. It kind of hit me that I was ending up like them, and I never thought I would. I was in a room with my auntie and my addictions counselor, and um, I looked in my auntie's eyes, and she didn't even look at me. <laughs> On my first day, I was thinking of my sister and how she came here. And I remember picking my room, and I was unpacking my stuff, and one of the staff here asked me, this was your sister's old room, hey? And I was like, yeah, it was. When I got here, I was scared. The first couple of days were the worst because you can't talk to your family or have a phone call for about seven days. And you just feel like you're deserted. You just feel alone. When you first come here, you're on blackout for two weeks. You just eat, sleep, and you try to get all that hard drugs and alcohol that you were on before and try and get them out of your system for a couple weeks. There are girls that are with us for six months at a time. And uh, there's usually an orientation period, a settling down period, and then we start our, our actual developmental curriculum. That was the first thing that got to me was the schedule. I wasn't used to rules or anything. I was used to doing stuff on my own. And for some who seek help at White Buffalo, sticking with what is ultimately a voluntary program can be a challenge. I was lonely. Every time I would phone my family, they would, uh, I would cry. I'd be like, please take me home. I don't want to be here. I'll change. And then my dad finally said, um, if I take you out, I know you, and you'll probably start up again. I've been giving up a lot since I've been here. And, um, calling my worker and asking her to take me home because I didn't want to be here anymore. And um, I don't know how many times it has happened, but she's been, like, she's made arrangements for me to go home a lot of times, and I just tell her, no, I'm not going. It's hard when you don't have family around you because you get lonesome and you get sad and you have to adapt to a new place and new friends and new people around you. So it becomes, in essence, a surrogate family. And as we develop more of that uh, trusting, bonding relationship, we are able to deal with the core issues that the youth bring with them. And then that's when the true treatment really starts. At Saskatchewan's White Buffalo Treatment Center, Teens are provided a holistic and culturally sensitive approach to treatment for their addictions based on the principles of balance associated with the four aspects of the medicine wheel. When you're here at White Buffalo, we help you from head to toe. 
physically, you know, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, right? If one thing's out of balance, you know, then you feel out of balance, right? And this cultural approach is often the first time many of these girls have connected to their own Aboriginal traditions. Before I got here, I've never went to sweats, I've never smudged, and I've never prayed in anything. And when I got here, it just kind of happened. I've been learning how to speak Cree, and I learned how to bead. They come here, and it's it's just like a, it's like a spiritual awakening. In 2005, nearby Cartier Farms reached out to the facilitators at White Buffalo to see if their equine assist learning program might also benefit the youth at the treatment center. Today our exercise is actually called, I hear you, but I can't see you. So it's all about leadership today and taking the understanding that good leaders make good choices or make choices and change their plan along the way in order to understand what does a good leader look like. This program does contribute to the youth's um, journey, their healing journey through the um, White Buffalo program. The horses that go there are um, injured and they can't be ridden, so like it's like therapy for them too, just as much as it is for us. Their program fits so well with the way our phases and our wheel goes. That's how they teach over there. So we're teaching here and then we get there and it's like it's reinforced. That horse connects everything. The youth come here for about an hour uh, per session and that's twice per week. When I first got here, I was terrified of the horses. Just the way they looked and the way they acted sometimes. But I got over it and now I'm just, it's the best part of being here, you know, working with the horses. A lot of it is uh, nurturing, caring for the animal, relating to the animal, because the animal is very responsive to the varying needs of the youth. And uh, we see the behavioral change of the youth as they continue to participate in the program to bring them together as another way to look at how um, addictions treatment can be offered and, and does work um, for some individuals very well. The horse throughout our history has really played a significant and interrelated role with First Nations Aboriginal people. Um, there's also the recognition that the horse has a spiritual sense. They're medicine to us, to First Nations people, Aboriginal people, so that's a big thing for us. Um, I met Rebel. He's the biggest horse there, and it, like on the smallest ones here, so it makes me feel, I don't know. Like he like he protects me. <laughs> I look forward every week to see him. He's an older horse. Um, his name is Simba, and he's pretty small. And he's so calm and quiet, and he listens like. You know, I had to build, like, I had to build trust with him and I had to respect him for him to respect me. My favorite horse was Doc. He's really pushy and he'll test you. He's not mean, but like, he'll push you around to see like, if you'll like, put boundaries in place. So to start out with, you're gonna decide who will be the blind drivers and who will be the leader. There's a closeness that I think can't happen in that same way in, in more typical kinds of um, counseling approaches or treatment approaches. You can communicate with them and read their body language. And like without them speaking to you or anything, you can still understand how they are. They see the horse as a friend, someone they can trust, someone they can talk to about what's going on for them and that that horse isn't gonna tell anyone else or judge them. You can take your blindfolds off and you can decide who's gonna be the leader next. So again, in those areas of the medicine wheel, what is unique about the horse and what the horse is bringing to the girls? And you can see that when the girls are with the horses and the sense of calm they can have with the horses, uh, healthy touch, what does that mean? They get that from the horses. How would we teach that? How do you teach healthy touch in a treatment center? That energy that, you know, when the horse is maybe not in the best mood, the girls pick up on that, right? And the horse is teaching them and how they can speak together or not. 
In the time spent with the horses, each of the girls is given an opportunity to not only bond without fear of judgment, but to come to terms with their own rehabilitative needs and the ongoing challenges of overcoming addictions. I don't want to go back on the same thing. Like, but it's really easy because the people I hung out with, they're just like me, I guess. And um, it's hard to find a different group of friends. Where I live, like, there's a big problem with drugs and alcohol. It's hard for people to not get into it because of how much it's around. I didn't think that I had a problem with it until I got here. And I started learning about everything, learning about how it actually affects you and not just you, but the people around you. I need to stop doing what I'm doing because I didn't realize the people I was hurting as much, especially my mom. I just feel really bad because she didn't deserve any of that. For my nieces, I tell them not to go on drugs and alcohol because of like, they seen what, they, what it did to me and it's really not worth it at the end of the day because do you still go back to reality once you're off those drugs? And doing drugs and alcohol doesn't take away your, your pain or anything, your problems. It feels like I've grown up too fast. You know, my mom, she's still getting over my sister's death. She still hurts every day from it. And so I'm still trying to help her with it. And I'm still trying to help my dad with it. I've had those days where I just, I just didn't want to live anymore, and I'm still here. You know, you just gotta let people help you. You can't do it yourself. Working with children as vulnerable as those in their care can take a considerable toll on the staff at centers like White Buffalo. You know, that someone hurts that much that they have to steal a hand sanitizer and drink that to feel some goodness, that's sad. So I go home and I just wipe away the tears and just start praying and getting some peace back in there. You know, you have to be a good role model, right? I have to be healthy to help these girls. So we really stress that to the staff here that you need a wellness plan as well. So I go into sweats, I journal, I do the same thing that the youth do. Because some days it's, it's pretty tough. The success of the girls' rehabilitation once they have finished the program at White Buffalo depends largely on how much support they have at home and in their communities. The possibility of relapse is a constant worry. It's not uncommon for the youth to come back for a second uh, treatment interval. I still think, you know, wonder if I'm just going to go back to the same thing when I get home. I know even after this treatment's done, I'm not, I'm not going to be 100% better. It's, like, kind of scary being around alcohol, because, like, what if I just drink and but, like, um, they won't let me. So it's pretty awesome because, like, you have support. We do see a lot of people in uh, different communities, and they'll say, she came home different. <laughs> she may have relapsed, but she used the tools that you guys taught her to get back up there. I only have 42 days left. And um, now that I think about it, it goes by pretty fast. I want to show everybody that I can do it. I don't want to go back to the same thing. And like, I want to go to school. I want to finish it. I want to do something good. And college is after. So I'm really excited. I've been sober for about two, three months now. And I've met a lot of great people here who shared their stories with me and inspired me. I've made it for NAG, Native and American Indigenous Games, for soccer. And yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting because I made the top 20 out of uh, 50 girls. Life is full of mistakes and chances and new experiences. Before I came here, I was 
I was myself and now that I've changed and I've realized like I need to obey my parents and stay home and help them more and just really get back into my schooling and everything. I think it'll help and they'll be more proud of me. I always thought I was this bad person because I felt like I wasn't helping anybody with anything. But now I think, you know, I am a good person. I'm just really glad that I got this opportunity to come here and get help. I have more of a connection with my family. I can talk to them more. I can, like, talk to them about anything. I felt like I had a fresh start, kind of. But I um, went back to the same community. I wasn't, like, trying to get high because I really wanted to go back home. we rather have the youth in their communities with community members helping them because that's who they're going to live with. You know, this is the last resort.